So, um, recording in progress. So, uh, let me introduce our speaker. It's Zach Forrest this week. He's going to be talking about um, martingales and stopping times. So, Zach, it's all yours. Okay. So, uh, I was actually just saying this a second ago. I'll say it for the benefit of the recording. Even though I've been working with or trying to work with, really, martingales and stopping times for a while, I had some plans to work on a paper that never panned out and I needed this stuff for a paper. Uh, the fact of the matter is, even having read through the definitions, even having worked with the stuff a bit, even having been very careful to go through things over and over again, I find them to be a little bit tricky the first time or two through. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce martingales and stopping times in a way that I think is kind of natural to the idea. We're going to do some technical stuff. It's probability theory. You're going to have to do some real analysis, so you've got to be brave. And then what we're going to try to do is the following. I'm just going to go ahead and write up a laundry list or things we want. So things we want. Uh, so the very first thing we want, we want to have a nice way of envisioning games. And that's kind of our goal here. We want to be able to represent games or gambling with limited information. And what do I mean by that? Well, suppose that you go to a casino and what you do is you keep playing the same game over and over again, maybe a roulette table. I don't want you realistically to be able to look into the future and know whether or not you're going to win the next time around or how often you might win in the future. I only want you to know what is available to you right now in the present in my mathematical model. So we're going to have to try and figure out a way to couch that in terms of probability theory. And that's the first thing we're going to do. It's the simplest part. The next thing is, because we're talking about gambling, what we want to do is we want to be able to relate information or relate expected outcomes between times we play the game. So relate the outcomes of the times we play Imagine for a second that we're at this roulette table, and it turns out that when you're playing this roulette table, the first time, or maybe even the first couple of times you play it, the expected outcome is all basically the same. You have about the same average chances of winning versus losing. Everything seems okay. But maybe after you play the sixth time, all of a sudden, your expected values change wildly. Personally, I wouldn't want to play a game like that, not unless it really tilted in my favor. So instead, we need to make sure that these games are going to kind of respect each of the attempts we make at the game. If you play the game one time, then you play the game again, we really shouldn't see the expected value of the first game to the second game change that much. Or if it does change, it should change in kind of a nice way, maybe increasing or decreasing. So that's another thing we are going to want to do. Once we have those two things put together, we're going to basically have everything we need to talk about martingales. So once we have martingales, we are going to want to talk about what martingales are. So we're going to define, give intuition for, and show properties of martingales. And finally, the very last thing that we're going to want to do today is we're going to want to talk about the idea of stopping time. And we're also going to want something that we're going to call Dube's optimal, uh, I think it's sometimes called Dube's optimal sampling theorem or Dube's optimal stopping theorem. I'm going to call it optimal stopping because that's what Veridin's book uh, talks about. And incidentally, if you can get 
at your hands on a copy of Veridin's book on probability. Uh, it's just called Probability Theory. It's by Current Press, I want to say, through New York University, I believe. I can give you details afterward. That's a very nice book for looking through this material. It gives a very nice coverage for everything. Could you spell the author's name? Uh, Veridin is V-A, actually, I should put it on the screen. V-A-R-A-D-H-A-N, Veridin. Hopefully I'm not butchering it. Lecture notes? Yeah, it should be Courant Lecture Notes. I think it's volume okay. seven. Yeah, it's the same one as we're talking about. Okay, cool. Thanks. You're welcome. It's a nice book. I was kind of introduced to it tangentially, but now that I've had a chance to look through it, I can say I do recommend it. Okay, so um, when we're talking about the very first item in this laundry list here, things we want, we want to try and figure out how to talk about limiting information to a game player. And we want to do it in terms of probability theory. So if I'm pitching this to you guys as an audience, and I'm having you guess because I'm lazy and I like to make you guys do a little bit of work when I present, uh, what do you think I could do to limit information within the framework of uh, real analysis, measure theory, probability theory? Any guesses? Lewis, you should know you've been doing this recently. Lewis, you've been put on the spot. How do you respond? Yeah, uh, you would limit the size of the event space. That's the right idea. So in terms of a measure theory, I'm going to put this here. So in measure theory and probability theory, really, we limit the information via our sigma algebras. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, we'll have a situation where uh, F, which is a lot of times the sigma algebra or the sigma field symbol that probability theorists like to use, and sigma are sigma algebras And specifically, sigma is a subset of F. This limits our information because it limits the way that we can break up events and we can characterize events. You can also think of it in terms of granularity. If I had a space maybe on the one hand that has the very trivial sigma algebra, and then I have the full set, uh, the full collection of all subsets. These are all both on the same space, but on the other hand, one of them has a lot more information because I can separate my data differently. I can separate it more finely and I can make decisions based upon that. So to limit our information, we're gonna be using different sigma algebras a lot. Frequently, our notation is going to be using F, N, so uh, let me go ahead and put this down here. Frequently, we want what's called a filtration. I'm gonna try and make it look italicized, even though I'm writing it by hand. I hope you appreciate my effort. It's a fancy sounding term, but all it means is I have a bunch of sigma algebras, F1 or F0 sometimes, and F1 is going to be a subset of F2, and that's going to be a subset of, and it's just going to kind of keep on going. Sometimes we're going to be thinking of everything being subsets of Fn, so it's just a limited chain of sigma algebras, but occasionally we'll also just let it keep on going infinitely especially when you're doing things in stochastic games with applications to PDE, you're going to want your sigma algebras, your filtration of sigma algebras to just keep on going uh, forever. That infinite uh, nature is gonna be useful in those situations. Um, I have kind of a naive question. Sure. Um, so why specifically do you need the structure of a sigma algebra and why a filtration of them? 
what, so, what's, the, why, what's the use of this? Well, the sigma algebra thing is pretty easy to explain. When we talk about probability theory, we're just talking about measure theory. So we have a, a space of points. We have some sigma algebra, say F, because that's the one I've been using. And then we have a probability measure, P. And the measure is, well, it's just like any normal measure, but the difference is that P of omega is equal to one. Right. So for example, um, you could have the real numbers in two dimension. You could have your standard uh, sigma algebra for that. So I guess I'm just gonna use B because it is a borel sigma algebra. And then what you could do is you could have a measure P and the measure P could be what happens when we take um, the two dimensional Lebesgue measure, we restrict it to the unit disc say like this. And that would be a probability measure. You could also restrict it to a bigger disc if you wanted and then just divide by the area of the disc. Like that, that's also okay. The reason we want a filtration is because the filtration represents over time or over repetition, the gaining of information. So for example, okay. if you're playing a game, the first time you play the game, you don't know anything about the game. You play it, you see what happens. The next time right. you play the game though, you know that last time you won or you lost, and this time you're gonna play again. The third time you play, you know what happened the first and the second times. So you gain more information over time. That's why we need that filtration idea. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. Um, what exactly is it about? Like what properties of um, sigma algebras are, are, um, are necessary? Like why, why that specifically? They're what ensure the properties of measures work properly. I mean, among other things, for right. example, yeah. if you have a whole bunch of events that you're talking about and the events are all independent, what we want to be able to say is that the probability of all of the events put together okay. should be equal to the sum of the probabilities of the individual events. Okay, right. All right, thank you. You're welcome. It's actually a product of probabilities. That's fair. Okay. So we have our Sorry, idea question. here that we want to work with sigma algebras. Specifically, we're going to generally want a filtration. And we also know that, of course, we're going to be working in probability theory. But now we need to talk about what's called conditional expectation. Hold on, uh, Zach. Nathan. I think Lewis had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lewis. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sure. So you, so you fix the filtration, right? And intuitively, mm -hmm. we're supposed to think at uh, it's indexed by time. And at time t, we have a certain amount of information, right? Mm -hmm. Generically, it's not true that at time infinity, uh, when we intuitively should have all the information about our game, uh, this doesn't form a sigma algebra. Are there any conditions when you could say that at time equals infinity, uh, this sigma algebra has, it actually is a sigma algebra and not just an algebra? Uh, yeah, actually, we're going to see something about that in a little while. So that idea kind of ties in with the idea of stopping times to an extent. Also, when you're talking about infinity, uh, so I haven't seen this in lots of uh, examples. The only example I have for you off the top of my head is in the area of stochastic games. So in stochastic games, the idea is that you've got maybe some kind of uh, shape in Rn like this, probably a bounded domain. You start at some point here, call it x naught, And then what happens is kind of like with a Brownian motion or a, a walk, a random walk, you just kind of track through the space and you hope that eventually as you track through the space like this, you cross out through the boundary somewhere, at which point you go through a process of awarding or taking away money from players. And now with that in mind, since it's possible for you to never leave the shape at all, you, you hope that that's not the case, but if, if, since it is possible, you have to consider the possibility of first of all, an infinite martingale sequence, and second of all, the idea that you're working in an infinite product space. And so in times like that, you end up having to work with to make everything work out nicely, not just a sigma algebra F, but a stopped sigma algebra F tau. Okay, uh, but so we'll get later to, so will we have actual conditions for when that 
time infinity this is actually a sigma algebra or yeah i will i will okay. give you an understanding of how it works generally okay. though what i'll go ahead and do is i'll put this down now and we'll revisit this later uh, when i have a chance to double check my notes and make sure i'm not just forgetting something but the idea should be that if i have a base sigma algebra f sigma or f tau is going to be sets that belong to f and they have the property that if I take A and I intersect it with a set produced by my stopping time, that the result is that it belongs to, the intersection belongs to part of my filtration, specifically the nth step of my filtration. In that circumstance, you are talking about a sigma algebra. Okay, sure. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Apart from this very basic tool right here, we also have an immediate tool that we're going to need in order to talk about uh, martingales. And to introduce that, I'm going to remind people of the radon Nicodem theorem. I actually had wanted to paste it directly from uh, Royden and Fitzpatrick, but it turns out I don't have a PDF copy of that. And I'm a good boy who didn't go out and immediately grab a copy of that. Uh, so I'm going to be doing this copying out of a hard copy of a radon nicotine theorem or out of Royden Fitzpatrick that I have open next to me for just such an occasion. Now I'm gonna be doing this with respect to signed measures. Royden and Fitzpatrick lists the original radon nicotine theorem with only measures, but I'm gonna be using signed measures because that's more useful to us here. So let X uh, M mu be a sigma finite measure space and let let me see that they use uh, they use new be a signed measure with respect to the measurable space X M such that new is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, meaning in other words, that anytime that mu yields zero, new should also yield zero. Then there is a mu measurable function f so that whenever I measure e, the set e using nu, it is equal to the integral over e of f with respect to mu, like that. A lot of times what we do is we call F the radon nicotine derivative of a nu with respect to mu. I'm not going to worry too much about the notation, although it is used pretty commonly, because I really want to use this in order to introduce what's called conditional expectation. So the idea is this. Let's suppose that I have a random variable. And what do I mean when I have a random variable? Well, first of all, what I mean is that it's a function. It maps from my probability space to the real numbers. It has to be measurable. And for our purposes, although you don't have to require this in some of the other applications of probability theory, it's going to end up being L1 as well at least L1 with respect to omega. And it's going to be on the measure space omega uh, F P. And we're going to take a sub sigma algebra sigma of F. 
Now, it turns out that in a situation like this, I can define a signed measure. Uh, I'm going to call it lambda now. And lambda of, say, A is going to be defined by the integral over A of x with respect to the probability measure like this. Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say I want to restrict my information to the set sigma, and I want to restrict my integration function to the set sigma as well. I want to make sure that I don't have a function f that is measurable respect with respect to f, the larger sigma algebra. I want to only use information that belongs to the sub sigma algebra sigma. So what I'm going to do now is say that by the radon nicodeme theorem, there exists some function f, which a lot of times, instead of calling it f, I'm going to use instead the symbology e of x, which is my random variable with respect to uh, or given sigma the sigma algebra I'm working with, which is sigma measurable. So that uh, the integral of f, or the expectation, if I want to use that symbol, with respect to my probability over a is equal to the integral over a of my random variable with respect to the probability measure for all a which belong to sigma. So to clarify, this is application of radon nicotine on the measure space with sigma algebra sigma, yeah, not um, f. Yep, not with f. I want to make sure I limit my information so that way I'm not having to deal with future information or information that I don't have my hands on yet. I only want to deal with current information, the limited sigma algebra sigma. That way I can characterize the behavior of uh, X over past information or over current information instead of the full information. It turns out that when you define conditional uh, uh, expectation this way, that you end up with a laundry list of properties, which I'm gonna put in front of you now. So we have a theorem. Okay. The conditional expectation uh, E of random variable with respect to limited sigma algebra satisfies the following. Uh, let's see, one, if F is defined to be the conditional expectation of X with respect to Sigma, then it turns out that the expectation, so now we're moving from conditional expectation, which is a function to expectation, the average value the expectation of F is going to be equal to the expectation of X. You can also put in here another part of this. The conditional expectation of the function, which is identically one with respect to sigma, is going to also be identically one almost everywhere with respect to our measure. That one probably seems pretty obvious. Now we have uh, two. If X is non-negative, actually, I'm going to write this out a little differently. Veridan has a whole book and he had time to write his whole book. 
without having to give a presentation, I don't have that same power. So instead, I'm just going to be kind of brief. If x is non-negative, then f, the expectation of x with respect to sigma, is almost surely non-negative itself. That should be another pretty obvious one. Uh, next one. The conditional expectation map is linear. I can elaborate if you guys want to, but I think by now we all have a pretty good idea of what it means for this map to be linear. I will go ahead and say that I'm going to fix the sigma algebra here just to be kosher. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, number four. With F defined to be the conditional expectation of the random variable X. It turns out that the integral of the absolute value of G, oh, with G, excuse me, of F is going to be less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of X. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Five, if H is bounded and sigma measurable, then the expectation of H times X with respect to sigma is equal to almost everywhere. I'm just gonna go ahead and omit almost everywhere. We're in the terms of integrals and measure theory. So that should be kind of obvious right now. It's equal to almost everywhere H times the conditional expectation of X with respect to Sigma. So hold on, is H, H is constant or H is what? Does H is just a bounded Sigma measurable function. Does it depend on, I claim that's not true in general. It should only be true of what if um H is independent of or is um completely determined by the information. That, so it, it depends has to depend on X, yeah. It's a function of X or what? No, when I it, when it, it should says, be independent of X, yeah. That's the whole thing. So what I'm seeing independent of not X but of sigma, I guess it should be independent of sigma. No, no, it's sigma measurable. Okay, never mind. You're right, you're right. I agree. It's sigma okay. measurable. So it's everything is good. You know everything about H already. I was it says. I was double checking everything and making sure I wasn't going crazy. Yeah, so I want to I want to make sure I understand all the points. So the first point says, um, well, one through three are kind of just nice, useful facts. But the first point says that if I average the conditional expectation um, over everything I know, then I, I don't add anything new. I just end up with the expected value I started. Um, so nothing, no, I get I obtain no in, new information. I just get the original expected value. So I lose information. It's not by averaging. Um, Five yeah, exactly. sets, I already know. So if H is sigma measurable, I already know what H looks like. So um, I can actually factor it out of the conditional expectation because it's a function that I know. Mm -hmm. And then I think I know what you're going to write next, but I want to make sure I understand as well. So, Okay. So uh, if, and this time we're going to get really fancy here, we're going to introduce two sub-sigma algebras. So we're going to have sigma... I'm going to use the same notation as them, even though this is one time I'm not super crazy about it. Sigma two is a sub sigma algebra for sigma one, which is a sub sigma algebra for F. Then the expectation, I guess I'm going to put it down here like this. The expectation of X with respect to my smallest sigma algebra is going to be equal to what happens when I take the expectation with respect to the larger sigma algebra, sub sigma algebra, sigma one, of the expectation 
of x with respect to, oh, I'm sorry, no, my bad. This should be sigma two here. I knew something looked funny. Sigma two, and this should be sigma one here, like that. Well, both are true. This one's just non-trivial. This one is not, well, actually this one isn't so bad. Since we know that expectation, conditional expectation basically just comes down to checking a criterion that involves integration. All we have to do is pull out the right sets, do some well, integration and check all these different things. And it comes out pretty easily. If I agree. Want, we can do that. What's the, the other direction is, it, so the other direction is actually a triviality though. Um, yeah, it should, well, want more or less. So. I'm sorry, but like, what's the, what's the intuition for this? I, I still, I always forget this tower property. I switch sigma one and sigma two. Oh yeah, and it does make it a little bit different when you switch that. Uh, so the idea here is basically that because we're because we're looking for things that behave more or less the same on average, even after we go to less information, if I lessen the amount of information I have for x, which is f measurable, and I lessen it by going straight to my smallest sigma algebra then I could do the exact same thing if I first started out with the conditional expectation with respect to my first sigma algebra, the middle one, and then took the conditional expectation of that. In other words, when I start doing these conditional expectations in chain, it doesn't really change the average value at all. Okay. It's always gonna be whatever the smaller sigma algebra is, yeah? It's, mm -hmm. if you average only with respect to less information then you're gonna get less information. Exactly. Although, as you pointed out, the first one says that when I start trying to take the actual numerical expectation, the mean value, it doesn't change anything. Okay, so then we have number seven. And this is, yes, this is actually the last one in this list of properties for conditional expectation. It's a version of Jensen's inequality. And so what it says is, if we have a convex function phi, and uh, f, of course, is going to be our conditional expectation for x with respect to sigma, then Uh, first of all, if I take the conditional expectation of phi composed with f with respect to sigma, the result has to be greater than or equal to phi composed with f. Oh, I'm sorry. This should be x here. My bad. And... This is the next part here. And the expectation of phi composed with x should be greater than or equal to the expectation of phi composed with f. All right, as Nathan said, I, I agree. The very first three properties are all very obvious. They all come about through our standard integration properties. There's really nothing here but to apply the definitions and go from there. Uh, the fourth one is not super difficult, but it does require you to carefully check through some of the properties here. I believe the easiest way to do this one, and this comes directly from Veridin, is to say that, well, if I want to do the integral of x, over uh, some set A, what I should be able to do, or excuse me, this should be the expectation of X, my bad, that all you really need to do is take the supremum of the measure of lambda of A that we got before when we were actually defining what we meant by the conditional expectation, and then subtract from that the infimum of lambda of, let's just say B to make things differently, and once you start writing things that way, it becomes pretty easy to see how it comes about. Five is a really easy exercise. That one actually comes down to some really classic measure theory stuff. 
you start out with maybe either a, an indicator function or a simple function for h, and then work your way up through the definitions of various uh, integrable functions. Uh, let's see, six. Six, like I said, is not so bad. You have to write out the different expectations and actually integrate them with respect to your data from sigma two, but that one's not bad. Jensen is actually the only one that I have not gone through extensively. It's again, not a very hard one, but it requires some extra information that I want, don't want to try and go through. Instead, I'll just go ahead and point at Jensen's inequality here for expectation, conditional expectation to say it's very useful for us, especially later. And actually, I think I'm ready for a, uh, do I throw this out here? No. I, well, I guess I'll point this out for later. One of the ways that we're going to use uh, Jensen's inequality later is when we're talking about um, maybe taking a random variable x and then taking absolute value to the power of p like this or magnitude to the p like that, and then using that for some of our results. So we'll use that later. Everybody okay so far? Yeah, I want to add a property to the list though, so maybe an eight. So if okay. x is a random variable which is independent of the sigma algebra, so of the information that you already have, then its expected value is just, or its, its conditional expectation with that sigma algebra is just the expected value. You don't get any new information. Oh, so x is independent I see. of. I see. So if x is independent of sigma. Yeah, which needs its definition, but it just means that generated sigma algebras are independent. Uh, then the conditional the expectation is just the expectation. X. And it's to be contrasted with five, I guess, um, which is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. If you know what H, or if you know what H is, then well, it can be factored out of the expected value. So you, you obtain full information about H in five, whereas in what numbers is eight? eight? You obtain no information about X. Exactly. Okay, everybody's comfortable with conditional expectations, what I'm hearing. I also see that we're quickly running out of time, so I may be doing another presentation this next week. So let's go ahead and move on to martingales. I'll at least um, mention the word uh, martingales, and we'll go from there. Okay, so let's put this here. Definition. So let Omega F P be a probability space. And we're also going to introduce a filtration of sigma algebras. So to start out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a finite filtration, meaning it's going to end after N sigma algebras. And then afterward, we're basically going to shift from that point onward to infinite uh, martingales and infinite filtrations. The work is not really that much different. So let F1 be a, a sub sigma algebra of F2, be a sub sigma algebra of etc. all the way up to our biggest sigma algebra Fn, which I'm just going to call F as well. We say that a sequence, a finite sequence, I should say, Xn, or excuse me, messing up my notation here, Xj for j less than or equal to n of random variables. is a finite martingale. Sometimes we will say of length n, just to make sure we're clear on how many uh, sub-sigma algebras we're dealing with. If, whenever I take the conditional expectation of the nth member, of my sequence with respect to the previous sub-sigma algebra, 
The conditional expectation is just the previous member of the sequence. So what that's telling us is whenever we have a martingale, a finite length martingale, uh, martingale, what we're talking about is a sequence of uh, random variables of integrable measurable functions with respect to the probability space whose behavior on average doesn't really change from one step to the next. So to go back to gambling or games, if I'm playing roulette in a uh, casino, I expect that every single time that I get a value, an output for my uh, play of the roulette wheel, so whatever I win or lose, the various times that I play over and over again represent a martingale. Each random variable is simply the output from the roulette table after I play. They form a sequence, and the expected value of that sequence doesn't change over time. We can also make this a little bit better. We can make it uh, for infinite martingales. Uh, I'm sorry. Should should that be should that be just that just applies to xn? Well, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. I'm so used to talking about infinite martingales here that I just kind of automatically write n. It should be j. Good catch. Okay. Thank you. If we have a full sequence xn, so in this particular case, n just means a natural number, and an infinite filtration, f1 subset of f2 subset of fn, and it just kind of goes on forever like that. We say we have a martingale. I'm not even going to use the term mar uh, infinite martingale. I'm just going to say martingale in these circumstances. If x1 all the way through xn is a length n martingale for every n. So that just extends things nicely. And it also ensures that when we extend our work from finite length martingales to martingales that are infinite in length, we have a really easy time of doing so. Basically, everything just comes over automatically. All right, let me pull up a few examples because I feel like this is one of those definitions that needs a few examples to make sense of everything and also needs a few remarks. So uh, I believe one of the examples that you see sometimes mentioned in the literature, and I'm going into dangerous water now because this is coming off the top of my head from recollections of reading a paper by Manfredi. Um, Actually, this kind of we can actually track this back all the way to the very first uh, property of my theorem up above. Uh, the expected value of one with respect to sigma equals one almost everywhere. So if xj is always equal to identically some constant value like that, then either finite or infinite martingale xj. That's a really simple one. It's not necessarily a super helpful one, but it's a very simple one. Uh, I'll also make a few remarks really quickly. And I think after that, we're basically going to run out of time. We only have about 10 minutes, right? And I want to leave some time for questions and also to talk about what we're going to do next time, I suppose, since clearly there's going to have to be a next time. So if we go back to... Our theorem above, and I'll go ahead and get you a reference really quickly just to make sure that we have this here. Ah, we're going back to part one again of our theorem. Our theorem says the expected value of a random variable and its conditional expectation are identical to one another. So as a consequence of that, the expected value 
of uh, our very first term in the martingale is going to be equal to the expected value of the very second term in the martingale, which is going to be equal to et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the expected value of the nth term. And of course, if this is an infinite martingale, it just keeps on going. So that means, in fact, we can just consider it to be a constant C. This is really useful in uh, the applications that I've seen, because what you'll be able to do is say, well, our random variables have some property that we want to show, or we, we want to be able to show that our random variables all share the certain property. So you go through the steps of making sure that your random variables indeed form a martingale. You show that one of them has the correct property that you want, and then in expected value, the moment you do that, all of them have exactly the same property and expected value. So it walks your property in from whatever step you're able to establish it all the way through all the other steps. Uh, let's see. Another example that I want to do right now. If uh, x is a random variable, so in this case, I'm only going to be giving you one to begin, or begin with. And uh, we have a filtration of sigma algebras. I'm not going to say how far because it doesn't really matter in this case. I'm just going to say it goes all the way up through F eventually. Then we can go ahead and build a martingale by defining xj or xn, whatever you prefer, to be the conditional expectation of x with respect to the jth filtration sigma algebra. In this case, xj is a martingale. And uh, let's see, I have just another minute or two. So I'll make that example number one. Example number two. If xj is a martingale, with respect to, once again, a filtration, I'm trying very hard not to put too many mentions of the filtration. Sometimes you'll actually see an expanded notation, which I'll mention here really briefly, which is instead of putting xj only, they'll put xj and then fj like this. That's pretty typical notation to talk about a martingale. But in our cases, I'm not going to be introducing multiple filtrations of sigma algebras. So generally speaking, I'm going to suppress the sigma algebra notation like this. And I'm just going to assume we all know it's going to be F, J of some type. So um, from example one, uh, that would be the only martingale given a filtration. I don't know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Well, not the only martingale, but this is one easy one that I can build. Exactly. Okay. I can build a martingale from it if all I do is take conditional expectation with respect to my sub-sigma algebras. Okay. And in my second one here, if I define uh, the random variable yj by taking xj and then subtracting from that xj minus 1, actually, in this particular case, I probably want to allow my j's to go through 0 as well, but no big deal. That's just a little bit of terminology. Then I can also produce another martingale yj. And it turns out, by the way, if you check this, the expected value for yj is going to be zero in this particular case. How do I know? Well, if we start taking the expected value here of yj, we apply our definition. So it just becomes the expected value of xj minus xj minus one. Based upon our theorem, I know that expected value or conditional expectation is going to be linear. So what I can do is I can pull this apart into xj minus 
xj minus one. We already said above from our remark that the expectation is going to be equal for both of these two things. So it turns out that we simply get zero. All right, looks to me like I have five minutes left and that's not really enough time to do anything more. So um, Nathan, do, should we go ahead and open up the floor to questions? Sure, so um, if anyone has any questions and they haven't already asked. Um, yeah, so, um, okay. Can we have some sort of like intuitive overview of um, what we want? Or I, I don't know, where, where are you going with this? Okay. So martingales are kind of a general tool and they're very abstract. You can use them in a, at least a couple of different places. I mean, Nate, Nathan's talked to me about wanting to use them for, is it Ito theorem? Yeah, so I'll, I can describe, well, if you want to explain first your application of martingales, I'll explain mine. Okay, so I think I mentioned before, and I know I've done this before in a, uh, a talk previously, although it was a much longer, higher level talk. If I'm playing a game and the goal of my game is I start at some fixed point that's given to me, and then I travel a certain distance, always the same distance in any direction, and I get to another point, and then I travel another of that same fixed distance to another point, and I just keep doing this according to some probabilities. And I look to see the very first time, if it ever happens, that my steps eventually cross onto or outside of the boundary for my shape here, then what I can do is I can generally consider the outcomes of moving to that spot a, a martingale. The, what are the outcomes in this case? Well, usually in the games I play, you treat it almost like money. So wherever you land in the space, there is some dollar value that either you have to pay to another player or the other player has to pay to you as part of the game. And when you exit, time's up, whatever your current balance is, you are going to have to pay it off or you're going to have to collect it. So in a situation like that, the values that you rack up by moving from spot to spot are kind of like your random variables. In that case also, we would show that this is a martingale and then show that once you get to this very last step right here, assuming it happens, then any properties I know of my expected value for that step can actually be traced from that step back through my entire sequence of steps all the way to here, which would show that I have the property also inside the set as well as on the boundary. So do you have other real world examples? <laughs> I'm trying to think if there is a good real world example for this. I can give a few. I've heard of these before, so, but you know. The original movie from what Zach is talking about, which is, well, games. Uh, so this betting game where you, um, you know, you either win or you lose a fixed amount of money. Yeah, Ends usually up, those are like barely Nathan has never gambled before. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's not realistic gambling, but it's very simple. <laughs> um, and you can either go one way or you can go the other way. I think is probably what Nathan is thinking based upon yeah. a coin flip. Anyway, so, random walks are examples. Browning motions examples, and then um, well, certain uh, combinations of those things are also brown or are also examples of Martin Gales. Um, okay, coin flips of a fair coin we would yeah. get martingales. Okay. So not a, not a very exciting game, but still a game. Yeah. Uh, the application I had in mind for martingales, uh, so if you look at this thing called Ito's lemma in the stochastic calculus, um, it's describing functions of essentially a Brownian motion or some other stochastic process, a uh, drift diffusion process is what it's called. And if you happen to know that the function of this process is itself a martingale, um, then that function will satisfy its own deterministic differential equation. And then you can actually kind of determine what the process actually looks like by knowing that. Um, it, it tells you something about the actual process. So um, people study Martin goes for- That's interesting. Their study I, of that clicked for me. Okay, thank you. Sure. So that's, that's sort of my naive interpretation of why Martin Gills are important. Um, okay. But, so what's up next, next week? Ah, so next oh. week. So right now, we've uh, introduced what we need for conditional expectation. We've introduced martingales, which is really why we need the conditional expectation. I'm probably going to come back and do some of these examples again really quickly, maybe with a few more details. Um, I really do want to give you guys more details if I can possibly swing it. Then we're going to get into a few lemmas of properties for martingales. 
there are some useful properties they have like um and this one i'm going to spoil it now i've been thinking about it a lot because i wanted to give you guys a decent intuition of what it's talking about um and i'm not going to let a little thing like running out of time stop me from sharing what i figured out uh so there's this property that says if i take my martingales uh, and I look at a set of points omega from omega such that the maximum or the supremum, I suppose, of the absolute value of my terms of the martingales evaluated at omega exceeds some certain value, call it L like this, then the probability of this set is less than or equal to one over L times the integral of, and they couch this usually in terms of a finite length martingale. Uh, I believe it's the absolute value. I cannot remember for the life of me now if it's absolute value or just X. I'm just going to say Xn. Although it could, uh, it's actually probably absolute value. I'll have to go back and double check this for my own sanity later. Oh, it is absolute value. See how great I am? That's just how wonderful I am, Brittany. So um, we're going to learn properties like this. <laughs> This one is nice because basically what it's telling you is what you can expect behaviorally from a martingale, either finite or infinite, because what it's saying here is as L gets very, very large, you would say that the probability that evaluating any one of your terms of the martingale at omega is going to make you go above the value L starts to get very, very small. In other words, basically the joint or the shared conditional uh, or expectation of the martingale is basically telling you how likely it is that you're going to start exceeding certain values. And of course, the bigger L gets, the less likely it is that you're going to do that. It probably looks a little bit like Chebyshev's inequality, if you're familiar with Chebyshev. Well, turns out that that actually is a pretty good comparison because we use Chebyshev for that. Uh, let's see, what else are we going to do? We're going to talk about a couple of theorems of Dube, which are just for martingales without stopping time, which characterizes martingales, lets us break them apart into pieces that are nicely behaved for us um, and give us some nice inequalities. Uh, and then we're going to move on to stopping times, where the idea is that we are going to try to characterize the decision to stop playing the game as another random variable. We're going to try to make sure that random variable only takes into account the information that you have until present time, and then ask the question, if we stop based upon a random variable, our martingale process, do we still end up with a martingale? Do we have a martingale overall? Do we have a sigma algebra overall based upon that stopping time? And do they share the nice martingale properties they want them, we want them to have? just because we started out with a martingale or sub martingale or super martingale and a stopping time. And then I'll probably eventually, so I, I've aired out my dirty laundry of trying to play stochastic games for PDE purposes a couple of times now. I'll try and see if I can find an example of it happening. I'll just give you the simple rules to the game instead yeah. of the whole spiel. And then I'll actually show you some results that have been done with it. Okay, cool. Maybe Nathan can um, talk about martingales. I will at some point. I'll talk about, um, well, at some point I'm going to be talking about Ito. Maybe after so, Zach. Uh, yeah. Disparaging I think my Alice talk on, little, on um, martingales <laughs> letting Nathan translate? My yeah. goodness. In my so, talk, wait until the recording is done. Gosh. Yeah, what's wrong with you, Brittany? So I think that's it for questions, at least with, with regards to this talk, yeah? It seems like it. I think we're probably about, what, five minutes over? Yeah, about, but we started about five minutes late, so it all averages out. Um, nice. So, okay, Ooh, I look, thank our speaker. So, yep. everybody clap. And I'll stop <laughs> recording really quick. Sounds good. <laughs>